thanks for your introduction and uh, it's a great pleasure to come here to give this uh, uh, you know kind of a more in-depth discussion about this important topic and uh, this morning we hear about uh, this climate change issue and in particular about the sea level rise so i hope like uh, and i uh, thanks the organizer to give me this opportunity to uh, give a kind of uh, more like uh, in-depth interview like uh, set up the context uh, for the first part of this workshop so my topic is uh, uh, sea level rise, global and uh, regional. Uh, so here is uh, my outline. Uh, oh, I have to say, I need to acknowledge all the, you know, like uh, in the past, like uh, my, my funder, you know, so basically that's uh, uh, in the past several years I have been working on those projects. So basically, uh, to give my talk, it's not just myself, it's basically based on the uh, CSR sea level project, so led by our uh, former like a leader, uh, Dr. John Church, you know, he moved to the uh, University of New South Wales about two years ago. But uh, uh, many work is, uh, uh, you know, under his leadership. Uh, so here is uh, the outline of my talk. So uh, first, I want to give you some uh, kind of background information about sea level rise, the, the global and the regional contribution. So basically, we can understand a little bit more about this uh, sea level rise issue. And then, you know, critical part about any sea level study is uh, you need to do the projection. So you want to know uh, what the sea level rise is going to be by some time. Like this morning, uh, we already heard some number about a half meter and one meter uh, by 2100. So here I want you to give, me, give you a, a little bit more detail about how do you uh, come up with, uh, you know, with those numbers. And then obviously, you know, we, we know that also in addition to this long-term climate change issue, but also there's some climate variability. So obviously, whenever you're dealing with um, you know, climate change, you know, climate variability study, you need to separate them. And uh, obviously, there are some complications from those natural variability. And, uh, you know, I want to give you some example there. And then, you know, because in the recent years, we did, you know, quite a few studies uh, in Australia and you uh, know Western Pacific, and also in some uh, uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia country, like uh, Malaysia and uh, Vietnam, and, uh, you know, the few countries there. So, uh, today, I want to give you an example uh, in the West, uh, Western Tropical Pacific country and also Australia, you know, see what we did in the past and uh, for the, you know, the adaptation purpose. And finally, some discussion. So basically, I want to, uh, in particular, focus on the mean versus the extreme sea level and uh, how should we do the adaptation and the mitigation planning. Uh, so we know it, obviously, you know, it's already well known, like uh, our climate system is uh, it's changing. You know, the, here it shows like, um, uh, you know, increase of the global mean surface temperature. So each year is a circle. So it's uh, starting from 1850 uh, to the 20, uh, you know, 16. So you can see basically every year the circle is become larger and larger. Although <coughs> there are some up and downs, but generally speaking, yeah, it's uh, become larger and larger. And uh, uh, you know, in the, like, uh, so you can see here is 1.5 and 2. Uh, degree there. So basically, that's associated with the Paris Agreement. So basically, we want to cut our or can string our warming uh, toward the 1.5 and the 2 degree. You can see, you can get the feeling that you know it's not far away from the target. And uh, on the left, it basically shows this time series. Basically, uh, rather than show this uh, like animation, but it's uh, like uh, the simple time series. So you can see, although there are up downs, but basically it's uh, always uh, increasing there. So you know the system is warming, but you may wonder you know, where is the extra heat? It's uh, uh, going to be uh, stored somewhere. So basically, it's uh, in the ocean because um, I think this morning uh, uh, Dr. Nihan Dai mentioned about the there's a huge heat capacity of the ocean. So basically, over 19 uh, since the 1970s, right, the ocean stored like more than 93 percent of the extra you know heat uh, because the ocean got a huge capacity. And uh, you know, atmosphere in comparison is only about two percent. Although we are talking about global warming, uh, usually we are talking about uh, atmosphere warming. But you should know the most of the warming, the heat, extra heat is goes, goes into the ocean. And um, whenever we're talking about the climate change issue, we need to you know, always think about the observation because that's the only way you can really get a sense of what's the reality of your climate system. How should we understand it? By doing that, you can do a little bit more theoretical understanding, also maybe doing the modeling to help you understand the system. So here we should we have to say you know the. The study has progressed a lot in terms of the ocean observing system. So here uh, you can see, you know, each dot is kind of uh, observing like a matter there. And uh, for the sea level purpose, you know, I would say the recent year the 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 progress is that we got this Argo float, it's like autonomous like underwater float. So every ten days 
if liquid profile up and down, you know, in the deep ocean and send the signal uh, through the satellite. And we have four thousand of them, you know, globally. So basically, cover the global ocean pretty well. And uh, for the sea level, we obviously we have this traditional tidal gate, you know. So we have some tidal gate as long as like two hundred years old, and there are you know quite a few like more than one hundred years old, and also there are uh, you know, many of them. But basically, it's uh, because it's tidal gate, so it needs to be along the coastline or at uh, some island in the middle of the ocean. But otherwise, in the open ocean, we don't have the tidal gate. But the, the good news, I'm uh, good aspect of this one is that uh, for some location, you really have a really long, you know, like a record. And then, like uh, since like 93, we have this um, new satellite, act, you know, like uh, altimetry. So basically, from the the, the the surface, from the air, from the, you know, you can measure the the sea level, you know, like uh, globally. Every 10 days, you can get a cycle, you know, measure the this global, you know, like uh, you get a very good, you know, spatial coverage, you know, to measure the sea level. And uh, since 2003, we have another new exciting measurement. It's very critical for the sea level study. It's called Greece. So basically, this way, so the air of the satellite, you can measure the, the change of the gravity. So by some smart design, you can uh, change, change, convert this change of the gravity into the mass change. So basically, in the, within the ocean, if somehow you got uh, some water accumulated there, you got the extra mass there. So basically, this satellite can detect any change of that. And also, in, this is not only for the ocean you know, application, but also for the land. If uh, imagine you have an Antarctic ice sheet, if there's a maritime, if it loses mass, so this satellite can tell you how much mass is loose you know, by this global uh, ocean. So it's a pretty exciting part. So basically, basically based on those like uh, old and uh, you know like a modern like observing system, we have a good coverage of the sea level. So here, you know, if we put everything together, we got a global mean sea level time series starting from 1700 to the 2100. Obviously, uh, you know, starting from 1700, you got uh, some reconstruction based on some proxy data like the salt marsh or the other thing. But the idea is that you can see basically it's a pretty flat over you know first maybe like a 100 and uh, uh, you know almost like 200 years. You know, basically no much change here. And then starting from uh, uh, 1900 to Onwards, you know, you basically uh, you get some uh, like increase there. So if you look at the number, so you can see, uh, you know, the, the first like uh, starting from 1900 to the 2010 is about 1.7 uh, millimeter per year. And uh, uh, then you know, like uh, in the modern part, you got the observation and the uh, satellite altimetry uh, measurement there. Maybe I should use the models so everybody can see maybe. Yeah. So you can see in this recent period, you got this uh, satellite altimetry. And uh, then starting from 2006, you, know, uh, you got this uh, projection into the future uh, based on the climate model. So the idea for this plot is like you can see it looks like uh, the, the sea level rising rate has uh, become faster and faster. So in the, in the like, term they call acceleration is that uh, you know, without doing too much thing, you know, this way it will continue in the future. And then you can look at the numbers basically uh, for the recent like, satellite altimetry period, it's uh, starting from 93. Uh, you got roughly three millimeters per year, and uh, if we don't do anything about uh, this future climate change, it's like uh, if we do like a business as a euro, I uh, see by the 2100 you tend to get uh, like a 15 uh, millimeter per year. That's a pretty scary. Yeah. And uh, obviously, for any sea level study, we need to consider all the contributing processes. So here is a schematic plot from IPCC. So basically, uh, we need to understand all the processes within this diagram and they try to put everything together. So start from the ocean itself. So we know like ocean is like a, it's a huge, it's a occupied the 90, 90, 90, 90, like 70% of the Earth's, sea, the Earth's like surface. So within the ocean, lots of things can happen. You, you got this ocean property, ocean circulation, and whatever happening within the ocean can kind of cause the distribution you know, of the sea level, uh, because sea level is integrated with whatever, whatever happening within the water column. And also, obviously, the ocean can impact with the other component of our climate system. So, for example, the ocean can impact with the atmosphere through this air sea coupling. And the ocean can also impact with this uh, uh, chromosphere. Like, uh, for example, you know, in this part, it shows this uh, impaction with the ice sheet, ice sheet and the ice shell. And also, you know, the glacial melting also can affect this uh, you know, sea level. And uh, in addition, like, uh, the, obviously, the hydrological cycle, you know, the evaporation, precipitation, the groundwater, thing can all affect this uh, 
uh, like uh, you know, like the sea level. And, uh, and for those process, sometimes it's not only about the global contribution, but also there's a regional impact. So basically, uh, we need to consider those uh, process, you know, to study, to understand this uh, global and the regional, like a uh, uh, sea level rise. And, uh, you know, like uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have uh, quite a few different uh, measurements. So, so basically, we need to, we can measure this total global mean sea level directly by satellite altimeter. But also we can understand the contribution like a thermal expansion because once the ocean warm, it you know like it will expand. So for that part, we can derive pretty well from the Argo measurement. But also the merging of the Antarctic and the glacier, Greenland ice sheet, we can also get a quite a good understanding from, for example, from the Greece satellite and the other type of observation. So basically on the right here, we can need to sum up all the individual contribution and we can uh, compare to the total you know, global mean sea level to see whether uh, those, those, those weather is balanced. So this one called the budget closure. So in some sense, we have a measure to double check ourselves to see whether our understanding of this uh, uh, sea level process, whether it's right, whether we uh, understand all the contribution term you know, uh, in a reasonable way or not. Uh, so basically, that's a kind of a, a good thing for us to do. And uh, obviously, you know, whatever I show here is basically it's like on a global and a large scale thing. So we we are kind of in early stage. We don't have too much good understanding about how the signal from the open ocean communicate propagate in the coastal region yet, like the continental shelf, really like a estuary. So that's really like a, the WCRP. So this like a regional sea level change and the coastal impact. At one of like uh, you know ground challenges, so that's a difficult question. The sea level community is working on it to to really address this regional sea level challenge because uh, it's really the regional sea level like the people care about, right? Although you know we need to understand the global and the regional, but uh, that's the, the the like a focal point you know for many people. So so here you know in the next few slides, I try to introduce all those like the, you know contribution term. So the largest term here, you know, it's uh, the, the, this kind of a thermal expansion due to ocean warming. So once the ocean warm, it will expand. So here it shows the, this uh, ocean hit the Arctic, you know, uh, based on the Argo measurement because uh, it's a global, you know, coverage and uh, it has a data, you know, since 2006. So you can see this uh, like a warm color. So basically that's uh, the, the, the ocean, you know, basically warms. And uh, you can see definitely the, the, the rate is not uh, like a uniform. So somewhere it's higher, somewhere it's lower. And even some region is a little bit lower below the uh, kind of, you know, it's a cooling rather than warming. But generally speaking, if you do a spatial interpretation, you will get this kind of, uh, you, know, uh, act, you know, like tremendous like uh, heat uptick by the ocean. And uh, you can see like the southern ocean, like a, like a middle Atlantic, the southern ocean, you know, you can see uh, lots of uh, like heat goes into this uh, uh, region. So obviously it's not uniform everywhere. So, so far, this uh, thermal expansion, this uh, all ocean heat Arctic is a uh, number one contribution, you know, in the historical period. You know. The second largest contribution is the glacier. So, although, you know, the, all the fresh water storage in the glacier is only talking about, you know, like a 70 centimeter if you melt all the glacier. But historically, in the historical period, the second largest contribution is from the glacier. And uh, because of uh, the uh, geographic location, somewhere it can melt uh, easily. So, here shows one example of the glacier in the Switzerland. So on the you know, upper part shows the, you know, the, the situation in the 1900, and the you know, lower part shows like uh, in uh, 2012. So you can see after 100 years, you know, how much is melt. You know? So basically, once it's melt, it go, will go into the ocean. And uh, the other part, the, 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 it's a land ice. It's the, this ice sheet you know, in the Antarctic and the, and the Greenland. So I have to say, you know, like, uh, the freshwater storage in the Antarctic is roughly about 70 meters. Just now I mentioned glacier is about 70 centimeter. So here it's a, you have a huge freshwater stored in the Antarctic. And in the Greenland ice sheet it's only about six or seven meters. So you can see the, all the difference. But here, you know, in the historical period, the contribution is not many from the ice sheet yet. But in the future, the picture will change. So because of the, uh, it's quite a complicated system, so if you look at this schematic diagram, so you can see, obviously it's not just like a, a simple, like a static system. Basically there's an interaction between uh, the ice sheet, uh, ice sheet interaction with the ocean, uh, with the atmosphere, and with, uh, with the land. It's like a, rather than just a one-way or two-way coupling, it's a, in fact, it's a, at least a four-way you know, coupling there. 
So basically, you need to understand all the you know process, so then you can do the good pro uh, projecting about the future. So in fact, uh, you know, for the Antarctic ice sheet, there are the you know some mechanism to call it like instability. So means that once you stop it, you cannot stop you cannot stop it until somehow another mechanism will stop it. So in the Antarctic, there are quite a few um, you know mechanism. So that's that. Once it's initialized, you know, you may got a, you know extra you know like a, you know kind of contribution from Antarctic. So that's a this morning I mentioned, you know, the possibility there. So, so here is the historical, you know, like a measurement about the contribution from Antarctica, you know, on the left, and the, you know, Greenland from the right is from a, a Greece measurement, you know, the Greece satellite. So you can see the measurement, you know, the melting here obviously is not even. So you can see for the Antarctic, the melting is mainly from the West Antarctic. You can see uh, it's a huge here. But uh, for the East Antarctic, in fact, it's not melting. In fact, the mass is uh, it's accumulating. It's because of the more like a snowfall there. So you can see it's not the simple story, see, everything is uh, like a melting. In fact, it's, uh, some part is melting, some part is, uh, you know, increased a little bit more. But for the Greenland, the story is relatively, you know, simple. It's, uh, you know, in the most part is melting. So then the, in, the, in the bottom kind of show, basically shows the contribution starting from uh, 92. So basically from the glacier, uh, the Greenland and Arctic, so you can get the comparison of the contribution. Obviously, the glacier contributed more than the Antarctic and the Greenland. Although, you know, like in the future, it won't be the story because once you melt away all the glaciers, you won't have any glaciers to melt anything. You know? so, so that's the story. So last year we did another study. So basically, uh, you know, usually when, they, when people do the budget color, usually they just do like on, over some period. Uh, but we did a new, new like a new study. So we try to do instantaneous like a budget closure uh, at a year to year, you know, kind of, you know, like a scale. So basically here, it's uh, like a summary plot. So basically, uh, you know, this uh, this dotted this this bar basically shows the total sea level. So basically, over the ultimate uh, period, starting from 93, uh, so you can see the sea level rise. You know, starting from roughly about two millimeter per year uh, in the first uh, you know like year, but by the by the end, it's talking about more than three millimeter three millimeter per year. So that the increasing of this uh, global mean sea level rate. And uh, if you look at the individual contribution, as I mentioned, you, you can do a budget closure, you know, that, you, you get this uh, uh, steric sea level is due to the thermal expansion. Uh, you got the melting from the glacier, and you melting from the Antarctica, and the melting from the Greenland. So in fact, we identify this uh, uh, melting, so in fact, it's mainly coming from the Greenland, uh, you know, like ice sheet. So here is a little bit of summary here. So basically, in the beginning, uh, it's, uh, Anta you know, Greenland melting is only about 5%. But by the end of this period, it's got the, like a 25 percent. So there's a huge like a potential for the Greenland to contribute a little more, at least in the coming decade. Yeah. So this morning I mentioned briefly about this uh, Antarctic instability and also the projection about the future, you know, melting from the Antarctic ice sheet. So in fact, as I said, limited by observation and limited by theoretical understanding, we are really like in the early stage about you know Antarctic you know, contribution to the global sea level rise. So, so that's really like uh, you know all the projection very considerably, considerably. So even on the 100 time scale and uh, depend on the model physicists. So about two years ago, De Condor and the Pollard they published a paper in Nature. So basically they use uh, uh, you know like a, a different mechanisms. They use uh, although it's a kind of uncertain uncertain there, but they introduce a new mechanism. So rather than consider this uh, like a melting. Uh, you know, like uh, from the bottom warming, but they consider the surface warming there. So it's called a, a marine uh, ice cliff instability. So by doing that, they got a much larger, you know, like, a, you know, future sea level projection from Antarctic, you know, Marity. So basically here it shows the, at least their, their numbers. So by 2500, so you can see uh, if you uh, consider this business as a euro, like a scenario, so you got uh, like a, between 10 to 15 meters sea level rise from the Antarctic ice sheet alone. And uh, so this one is uh, really like uh, alarming and also relatively controversial. The sea level community have, have uh, lots of debate about this study. But so far, no one can just reject their you know, projection. It's uh, because they, they validate and they calibrate with their payload data. You know, because basically, you run a model, you need to calibrate your data, right? So, so they did lots of uh, intensive like, uh, calibration with, with the payload data. So, so right now, basically, the story is that you cannot reject this uh, possibility when we get uh, 10 to 15, like the sea level contribution from Antarctic ice sheet alone. 
And the reason why it's very different from the HCC AR5 in the number. So here, you know, for the contribution by 2,500, you can see uh, even for the, if you include all the contribution, talking about less than seven meters. So here about the Antarctica, uh, you know, alone, you get, uh, you know, between like 10 to 15. You know, uh, so that's, a, that's a kind of the thing we need to consider because uh, it's a, once it's in the global ocean, you know, locally we can feel it, like Hong Kong, everywhere, you will feel it's a global missile, all right. So, so far I mentioned about this global you know, contribution, but uh, as I mentioned that any process can also cause like a, a regional like a fingerprint. So here I want to introduce a little bit more about those uh, uh, called the C-level fingerprint. So this one is associated with the gravitational and the elastic response of this uh, kind of, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the solid earth. So like assume you have a big ice sheet, you know, like over a continent, and uh, this is the big bottom area. So, so impact of this heavy you know, mass there is two, there are two like, uh, you know, this pad. So why is it depressed this, uh, this solid earth? So basically, uh, you, you will depress the, it's like a, the solid earth is not solid anymore. It's like a sinking by it's elastic, elastic. If you put something on top of the balloon, uh, you basically you will suppress it. And the other thing is because you have a huge mass here, that's a gravitational attraction. You will pull the water toward you. So that's called this kind of a distribution of the, the sea level surface there. So once you melt the ice sheet, so basically imagine the scenario, you melt the ice sheet. So in fact, it's uh, there quite a few as part. Once you melt, the, you will basically put the melted water into the ocean. So basically the water moves from the, uh, the ice sheet into the ocean. But because you reduce this gravitational attraction, so in fact, the water will move like more into the, uh, the far field. And also because you reduce this mass load there, the solid earth will reform. So basically after this adjustment, so, so this is solid curve is the, the new sea level. And this dotted curve is the previous sea level before the melting. So you can see you compare this, um, the, the current sea level versus the old sea level. So you, you will find that uh, locally, the sea level is dropping. I know this is against the intuition, but that's uh, if you consider all those factors, that's what you can get. It's in the near field, uh, near the maritime resources, the sea level is dropping, but in the far field, the sea level will rise. So here, I want to show you one example of the solution. Assume like Greenland is maritime, so maritime has a rate of one millimeter per year. So you can see this is a fingerprint by solving the sea level equation. So you can get a, you get a sea level drop near the Greenland. It's more than three millimeter per year because the global average is supposed to be one millimeter per year, but locally you can get a, you know, like three or four times larger, you know, like a dropping of the sea level there. And then like in the far field, like Australia, maybe Hong Kong, in fact, you will get a higher sea level. It's more than one millimeter per year. So it's a, in terms of this uh, kind of far field impact, Hong Kong is like in the not uh, very fortunate situation because whenever you melt the Greenland, you tend to have more sea level rise than the global mean. And when you, whenever you melt Antarctica, Hong Kong is going to get more, more than global mean. So that's a, Kind of far field impact. So I have to say, you know, uh, for 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 this um, for this fingerprint, it's not well well known to the like ocean oceanographer field and also the climate field. In fact, it's uh, more like from the geodesy field. So so this part is not in the ocean dynamics. You know, like uh, you won't get from this uh, client model. You have to do the post processing by solving this sea level equation. So, so this is uh, what I talked about. It's like uh, you know the response of the solid earth, the ocean, to the contemporary melting, like uh, melting of the Antarctica. But also we have this ancient, like uh, you know, kind of uh, you know ice sheet. You know, thinking about this glacial cycle, the Earth system also adjusting to that, but on the much slower time scale. So the solid, the Earth can respond very quickly to the elastic part, but also can respond very, very uh, slowly to the viscous part. So here. Uh, you know, imagine you have this, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, like here on the you know, peak of the, you know, uh, glacier cycle, you have uh, like a two kilometer, uh, like a thick, you know, ice sheet over the North American continent. So imagine that's uh, like an A location. So you can see like a, so basically because of this building of the ice sheet, you know, the locally, so the land is depressed. So you got this uh, local land, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sinking. Uh, but uh, once you melt this, uh, Kind of ice sheet, so basically this one will rebound, rising. You know. So that's in the center of the ice sheet. But if you are looking at, like near the edge of this ice sheet, in fact, it's you got a totally uh, reverse like a response because uh, so basically this is like a solid reverse kind of response. So 
So here, they, I, this is a cartoon, but here it shows the, the real like result from one particular like a GRE product. You know. So basically, the bottom kind of shows this vertical line of motion associated with this uh, uh, solid versus adjustment to the previous glacier cycle. So you can see, as I mentioned, you know, you once have a, the huge ice sheet over North American continent, so now it's rising. So basically, like a rebounding there. But then for the like a, you know, you know, for the U.S. East Coast and the West Coast, you know, as this point is sinking. So the New York definitely, you know, right now it's a, even without any climate change, you know, just by this uh, the adjustment to the, you know, like a previous glacier cycle. So it's New York is sinking. So it's a, it's a there, you know, they got more problem to deal with, you know, in on top of this climate change issue. And uh, so 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 like basically for the continent, basically everywhere it's kind of slightly rising. And then for the ocean basin, it's slightly sinking. So there's a kind of this global sphere, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, adjustment. For for the for the Hong Kong, you can see you know the whole China is rising slightly. Uh, this this thing, but this one you we call the sea level, you know, like a relatively dropping. So it's a relatively it's good because it's a, a kind of you know helping a little bit, you know, with the, this sea level rise issue. And. Uh, just I mentioned about this maritime of land and ice and uh, you know, those fingerprints, but obviously we also need to consider the ocean dynamics. So that's uh, the part that you know, climate model can help. You know, basically, uh, we can you know, do the scenario run, you know, just like when you do the projection based on the climate model, we can get uh, this uh, uh, dynamic sea level. So that's part of associated with the ocean dynamics to get this contribution. So here is one example you know, based on the like, RCP 4.5. We have roughly 20 like a semi-fine model. You can get a, such a, a plot. So the number here is a centimeter. So obviously, it's not everywhere. It's higher than the global mean. So in fact, in fact some part uh, can be higher, some part can be lower. You know, because the ocean dynamics try to uh, displace water, you know, to some location, but also reduce like a sea level somewhere. So it's a it's a it's a you know kind of a, a redistribution process. But the the problem here, you know. For the stapled area means that the model tend to agree. For all the other area means that the model don't agree yet. So you can see it's a, we are in a really early stage. So it's a lot of disagreement yet. So we, we need to work more. And also obviously semi five model is cost resolution. Uh, we cannot resolve like a detailed process in the, for example, near the Hong Kong. So we need a little bit of, uh, more information here. So, so as I mentioned just now, basically, you know, all the global and the regional processes, so they move to the projection. So basically, uh, we need to uh, get, get this, uh, uh, like, uh, put everything together, you know, try to get the, the regional sea level projection. So, so, so here is, uh, we need to get, a, you know, very complex formula there. So basically, it's uh, only like in the recent years we can do that. So basically, you need to consider all the contribution I mentioned before. And also, you need to consider all the regional deviation. So by put everything together. and. Uh, so I want to show you some example of what we did in Australia. So basically, uh, we, we started from with the global mean sea level. So it's uh, the same everywhere, but consider ocean dynamics, consider the maritime of the, you know, those uh, land and ice, and consider the GIA. So to give you a feeling how those different contributions working with or against each other. So here, as uh, I mentioned, I start with the global mean sea level and also the uh, ocean dynamics. So you can see uh, over the southeast uh, part, you know, we got this uh, higher sea level elevation. It's purely associated with the ocean dynamics. That's due to the uh, subtropical gyre, you know, like uh, circulation there. So this is uh, you know, purely ocean dynamic you know, response. But if I add in the, the, the maritime of this uh, land ice from Greenland, Antarctic, you, you get in this, uh, this picture. But then if you add in the GIA, you get, uh, uh, you know, like change a little bit, but you got a dropping of the sea level along the coastline because the this is uh, you know, fingerprint. So basically here, uh, you know, it's a, uh, the, the, if you got all the contribution to, for the contribution, you got the ocean dynamics on the top, and the fingerprint, and also the GIA. So basically, uh, for Australian, the ocean dynamics is a dominant term to decide that it's a regional distribution. But for the Hong Kong region, for the South China Sea, I find that the GIA is one of the dominant term. You know, it's, a, uh, you know, it's quite a, you know, different you know, for different region. And, uh, Obviously, as I mentioned, you know, the, the cost reduction is not good enough. We need to do a little bit more kind of work. So we did the te testing, uh, seeing it's, uh, you know, because for the cost reduction, it's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, about one degree. And you are a different model when you do the, like, uh, you know, ensemble prediction, uh, you will get the missing data along the coastline. So basically, in practice, you, you do the artificial, like, a fill in the data. But here, we fill in using the, 
uh, like a dynamic or not script. So basically, we rather than just artificially fill in, we fill in with the high resolution model physics. That's what we did, and to get this uh, uh, you know, dynamic or not skilled uh, re response in the Austrian region. So I think the similar thing can also be done for the Hong Kong region. Yeah. So, so basically, I finished the, my, my part about this kind of uh, you know sea level you know projection stuff. So obviously, you know, we know that the kind of contribution, you know, uh, complication due to this natural world, which I quickly show one or two examples. So, so as we know, there are many factors to affect sea level. So here is, a, again, a schematic diagram. The horizontal is uh, the time, and the vertical is the magnitude. So basically, uh, you know, we usually concentrate on this part. It's uh, the sea level rise part, and those uh, variability, like the social with the, like INSO and the Pacific Decade variability, that's the, the kind of natural variability in the system. It's uh, make the sea level go up and down, and uh, then we will complex the, uh, complex, you know, make it complicated to detect any sea level rise. So, so we, we, a few years ago, we did a uh, first like uh, analysis. So basically we, we studied when the climate change signal in the sea level uh, will be large, and then you know, like uh, emerge from that variability of the sea level. So that's called a time of emergence analysis. So, so, so it's not uh, you know, uh, you know, developed by ourselves, but we are the first one uh, to apply to the sea level study. So basically, uh, here shows uh, again RCP 8.5 scenario. So if you just consider the ocean dynamics, you find that uh, you won't get much of the emergence of the sea, uh, sea level signal uh, you know, globally. So basically, uh, in the southern ocean, you got something. But if you're adding the global thermal expansion, because uh, that one will uh, boost your sea level rising signal, so you got uh, more like emergence like, uh, uh, globally. But if you consider all the contribution, you can, you can find that uh, you got a much earlier emergence of your sea level rise signal. So here is by uh, 2020, roughly, so you got uh, like a 50 uh, percent of the region. You got more like an emergence. So basically, you know, by when you know the climate change signal is clear in your climate system. So here we do like a different uh, you know contribution and get the thing there. So another thing is um, you know the the, the the trend over a short period. So you can find that uh, uh, you know you can get the you know like a trend of analysis over the altimetry got this. Uh, uh, you know, higher sea level rise in the Western Pacific, and the people, you know, in the in the community say, "Oh, that's climate change signal." But in fact, it's mainly due to the decade variability. Uh, so the thing is that we know in the system uh, there's a, like a, you know Pacific decade oscillation. So basically, every like a, you know a few decades, the system changing in the whole Pacific. And if you you know, concentrate on the recent like a you know, few decades, so you can see there's the kind of changing of the PDO uh, you know, from the 1970s, you know, changing from negative to the positive. And then from positive to negative in the recent like uh, one or two decades. So if you do the trend analysis over those two different periods, so you find that the trend map are very different. So in fact they are you know like counteracted with each other. So basically me indicated that uh, we need to be careful when you do the trend analysis uh, over like a one or two decades because that's the decade variability of your system. So and they are comparable in the magnitude. So that's a thing. So, so maybe quickly I can show you uh, the, the, some example of what we did in the sea level study. So, so we know that like, um, you know, for, for maybe Hong Kong, the sea level rise is like a potential threat. But for some like, uh, uh, country, like, uh, in particular like a Pacific Island country, it's a reality. Because uh, for example here, it's uh, you know, a fig, uh, figure shows that uh, some of Pacific Island are disappearing. So they, to them, it's a, it's a reality. They have to uh, deal with it right now. So the Australian government, you know, do a little bit of, uh, you know, help, you know, to the, you know, uh, like a neighboring, like a country. So basically, uh, we got this project called the Pacific, you know, Climate Change Science and Adaptation, you know, Planning Program. So it's a uh, uh, Australian dollar, like a 40 million over five years, roughly. So we basically help 15 uh, those uh, island countries in the Western Pacific to help them to study the climate and what's the uh, you know, the, you know, basically not, not only about the sea level, but also everything. It's about the rainfall, about the warming. So here is one example. We did the projection for the Solomon Island. So basically, uh, we put everything together, uh, the historical sea level and the future projection for this island. So they, they can, uh, those decision makers in that country can use this one, you know, as for their adaptation planning. And uh, obviously, we did a lot for the Australians. So every, like, whenever the IPCC reports in Australia, we will do a, like a national study. So for the most recent one, we provided some number for them, but then we have this cost to adapt, you know, like a, uh, 
uh, kind of a this is a project sponsored by the National Climate Change Adaptation you know, Research Facility. So basically, they got all the number about the you know, climate, climate projection. So they can provide the, uh, you know, you know, like the better information for the public, for the decision maker. So here is the, the, this portal. And uh, for example, for each city council within Australia, so this cost uh, the depth can provide the sea level projection for each city council. And also can get in, in addition like a map for each city council here uh, plot in the city council where I live in. So basically got this uh, uh, projection map, you know, like a future you know, projection, but you can get uh, in addition like a map. So basically all the blue area means that uh, by uh, 2100 it's going to be flooded over the high tide. So basically means that you know the name the, 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 the city council are aware, aware of uh, this uh, future sea level rising. And uh, I heard that uh, you know the my city council already take action because I know some friends are living in some area, so it's going to be flooded in the future. So they apply to build something in their backyard. The city council reject their apply application, say no, you cannot build anything more. Uh, so basically, at least the, you know, from the decision maker, they're already making something happen. So, so maybe in the I, I spend like a you know, few couple minutes about uh, you know like a, a little bit of discussion there, you know, because it's uh, then can a uh, next speaker can you know. Uh, Talking about more about this extreme sea level change. So we know, like uh, whatever I talked about, is everything is about the mean sea level. But in reality, they're in the photo sea level. So it means that in particular, the extreme sea level. So here uh, it shows the mean sea level. Here you have a tide, you know, high and a low tide. But on top of that, you can have the uh, extra sea level due to the storm surge, uh, due to the wind wave. So basically, those uh, extreme sea level is where you can feel the climate change or the sea level rise. It's not the mean sea level rise. Because uh, uh, usually you will feel that you know, through those extreme events. So here, an example shows uh, what happened during the recent typhoon uh, in Hong Kong, and uh, obviously, you know, because in the Western Pacific it's a, a very like a, you know hurricane intense you know region, and uh, you tend to have a more like maybe you know, like a, a in the future you know, based on the uh, climate projection. So here is a simple cartoon to indicate why the mean sea level rise is so critical. Maybe. You will say, oh, it's only about a half a meter, one meter. But here I want to say, this uh, impact of the mean sea level uh, will like, increase the likelihood of the flooding and the decrease the retain period. So here, the simple, like a cartoon. So you got the time series, maybe at one location, the sea level uh, fluctuation. Uh, you got the mean, the long term mean there. And uh, maybe you have a threshold, maybe thinking about it, it's the sea, sea wall. So basically, uh, once you above that threshold, you got the flooding. So over this uh, like a certain period, you only got uh, two flooding. So the retain period is uh, like uh, the total uh, interval divided by two. That's your simple your you know, retain period. But uh, in the future climate, if there's a mean sea level rise there, so basically you're shifting everything above. So basically imagine the distribution is still the same, but you got uh, this much higher, you know, like a fluctuation because of the mean sea level. And uh, now the chance you go through your original threshold, imagine you keep your sea wall the same. So basically now you got a, a retain period is much like a reduced because you got 80 events now. So basically simple like that, you know, it's a, uh, in fact, you know, there are some discussion, you know, about this uh, impact of the, you know, uh, sea level rise. In fact, we will uh, change the like a once per century event to a once per year event. So it's like uh, alarming. It's not si simply like talking about maybe uh, you know, like once per, per century or maybe once per 50 year. So in fact, it's once per century, now it's a once per year, like you see. And uh, yeah, so uh, the, that's the, maybe the, the last slide talking about the deputation option. So basically we, you know, as a scientist, we need to provide a number uh, for those future sea level rise, you know, by 2030, by 2050, by 2100. But then the, the community need to come up, come up with the deputation like options for the future sea level rise. So basically, you know, like uh, there are maybe kind of three type of uh, like adaptation to the sea level. So obviously you want to maybe, if possible, may want, want to retreat. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, quite often people don't want to go back because they are so addictive to this uh, like a beach house or whatever, you know, they want to stay at the beach. So although sounds are easy, but uh, usually this is not the option. But the other thing you can accommodate the, the, the sea level rise by, you know, elevate your property. And the other thing is maybe do the protection. You can do a build up a seawall or the other things. So basically, that's uh, all kind of the 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 the, 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 adapt, the adaptation options like possible. But the one thing I want to mention is maybe you associate with the accommodation uh, rather than build up a concrete elevation. But
but maybe we should consider the gold fluting. I, I think in Netherlands be quite aware well in this respect because they already uh, building like a new fluting, fluting house. And uh, in fact, uh, if you consider what happened in US, like in Seattle, you know, maybe it's not a new idea because we know like uh, maybe you watch a movie like called the Street Place, like in Seattle, right? So they have the, this boat house, you know, it's there, it's uh, working pretty well. So maybe we can come up like a, by considering the old technique and the new technique, we can build up the floating thing, you know, because the sea level rising is happening. We have to deal with it rather than thinking about the other thing, but maybe we can consider some uh, new engineering idea. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we can hold the questions until all the speakers. Altogether, there will be three speakers for this session. I like to acknowledge also that uh, there are quite a few experts among us to, for the discussion. So maybe we should move on um, for the second presentation. Um, Ms. Chen uh, from Observatory. Oh, right. okay. uh, so We learn more and more. I, I myself find it, find it more confusing. So, <laughs> um, with the uh, insight from Hong Kong Observatory, probably we can learn more about the local tropical cyclones, um, storm surge, with sea level rise. in charge of uh, um, uh, geophysics, time service, and uh, marine meteorological services in, in the Hong Kong Observatory. And uh, tropical cyclones and um, storm surge prediction are uh, those areas that I'm specializing in in the past uh, decade or so. And uh, so I'll, uh, uh, in this part, I'll talk about um, tropical cyclones, in particular, the associated storm surges and uh, its impact, and the relationship with the sea level rise When we talk about storm surge, here is uh, um, about the definition. Um, here, we are talking about um, the increase in the water level above the horizontal <coughs> tide. Um, that is the um, storm surge equals to the um, record sea level, or what we call uh, the storm tide, the total sea level, uh, minus the predicted astronomical tide. So um, the storm tide is um, just the combination of the and the uh, storm surge. And uh, with that, um, when the um, height of the um, storm surge, uh, the timing of which coincides um, with the, uh, um, the uh, high tide of the day or the spring tide of the month, then um, it will heighten um, or cause the um, uh, impact of the uh, storm surge more significantly. And uh, as you know, uh, Hong Kong is uh, located in the southern uh, uh, coast of uh, uh, China. And uh, we are being affected by uh, uh, tropical cyclones coming in uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Western Pacific. And that enter uh, the uh, South China Sea. And 
And um, when we talk about uh, song search, the most dangerous uh, trichocyclones that could um, bring us a severe storm surge are those that uh, will in fact uh, pass through to the south of Hong Kong. And uh, as you know, that we have the um, circulation uh, with the wind uh, blowing and kind of crop rise uh, in the northern hemisphere. And uh, when the uh, trichocyclone cycle like this, uh, the super cyclone I pass on, coming through in August 2017, and we will be experienced. Uh, actually, we, we will be experienced the, the strongest uh, winds from the east and southeast associated with the cyclone, that which brings all the water towards the coastal region. And um, well, these are a few uh, historical storm surge that uh, bring uh, severe casualties in, the, uh, in Hong Kong. And as you look at uh, all of them, are going to uh, basically uh, uh, across the Song Strait and then uh, going towards the south, uh, the south China coast, uh, making a direct or uh, passing in the close proximity of Hong Kong. And uh, in particular, talking about these uh, few um, typhoons, um, back to uh, in This one. Okay, two and a half All right, um, is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. And then we have uh, a number of uh, other typhoons in uh, 1900. Yeah, that would be better. And then, uh, in particular, um, two uh, specific uh, great typhoons of uh, uh, 1906 and 1937. We're talking about having more than uh, 10,000 deaths. Hong Kong mostly related to um, well, song search. Um, as are uh, all the uh, tropical, tropical cyclones uh, during the pre-war period. Uh, after the war, uh, in 1962, we have uh, another significant uh, uh, typhoon which brought about um, severe song search first. And um, well, in that case, uh, well, you can see the number are uh, uh, gradually increasing uh, because we have a more uh, better system and warning system. And uh, these are the some pictures that are collected from um, the, uh, the few uh, typhoons that I've mentioned. Uh, uh, this is from uh, 1906 and um, 1937, the second uh, typhoon that uh, caused uh, more than 10,000 deaths in, in Hong Kong in particular. Um, this is uh, a section of the rail track uh, from uh, Shati to Taipo. And uh, that's from uh, about um, a section of around two kilometers or so, uh, with damage, uh, including abandons, and um, caused the, the closure of or the uh, interruption of the train service of for a week or so at that time. And then um, in 1962, we have the uh, super typhoon one dot, and um, the typhoon, the soft touch associated with with it, uh, has bombed uh, the villages in the uh, Shati. In Shatina and in the Tongo Harbor, and which resulted in um, uh, 183 deaths or uh, people missing in this incident. And then um, the memory is still vivid, um, including the uh, super typhoon Katong uh, last year, and also um, the uh, super typhoon Matu uh, in September last month. And, um, well, this is um, the, the most uh, tropical cyclone so far in Hong Kong this year. And uh, we have the highest uh, tropical cyclone signal warning number 10, poised for more than 10 hours. This is actually the second longest uh, number 10 signal in Hong Kong on record. And um, we brought about record high storm surge, talking about generally over 2 meters storm surge. That is the increase in the level of boundary tide. And uh, actually, total harbor, including region like uh, Shaping and Taipo, the storm surge uh, was even more than three meters. And um, well, a uh, large amount of the uh, trees burned down, talking about more than 50,000, and uh, breaking of sea wall, uh, the glass walls, and also um, the windows. And so, um, it may be um, 
students opportunity to have a, a comparison here uh, about the uh, the uh, art talk in the last year and I think in, uh, just in January uh, in September. And both of them are actually uh, well uh, formed over the Western Pacific and then going through um, Luzon or Luzon Strait towards the uh, coast of uh, Hong Kong. And uh, both both uh, typhoons are across uh, to the south. And when I uh, look at the um, corresponding uh, radar imagery for these two storms, and this is a good comparison that you, 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 you can really say that uh, from these uh, uh, radar pictures that um, at the time when uh, Hato uh, was uh, on the closest approach uh, to Hong Kong, uh, about uh, 60, 50 to 60 kilometers to, uh, to the south, southwest of Hong Kong. And uh, you see at that time Hato has a, a rather so uh, basically, the highest winds are, are located usually around the high wall. And uh, so we are not, uh, uh, well, uh, this is not the worst uh, situation in terms of wind for Hong Kong at that time. Um, but the view at that time, it remained as a super typhoon when crossing to the sea, uh, to the south of Hong Kong. And uh, for the case of Marcus, you see that it's a different thing. Um, the, um, um, I mean, the, um, the wind distribution much expensive uh, circulation associated with the, the storm. And it also has a, a high water the lasses um, coming as uh, that uh, of the uh, hot top. But you see, they, uh, it had a very um, intense spiral rate band where the winds, highest winds are packing over there. And uh, actually, Matthew is, uh, uh, well, it weakened a bit uh, to severe typhoon category during the closest approach. But it has a more extensive circulation. As a result, uh, you can like, see from these um, threat reports of both cases, um, the threat reports are more comprehensive over uh, the whole of uh, Hong Kong, in particular over the coastal region. And uh, in terms of the, um, this is the, the figure shows the uh, total sea level, the maximum sea level reported during the two storms. And in fact, um, well, generally you find that uh, basically um, the sea level.
And um, <coughs> well, um, actually, this uh, here I want to show the uh, prediction given by our uh, um, operational long search prediction system. What we're using a model with that we're using is also a slush, which is a vector from um, NOAA, US. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, our system uh, can give a uh, well, pretty uh, reasonable uh, prediction of the uh, associated with micro in this case. And um, highest level actually recorded was uh, 3.88 meters uh, about Chaplin in the Victoria Harbor. And um, if, if you if you're here in the morning, uh, our director Sun also mentioned about what happened if the factory, uh, if the uh, bank could uh, cross um, uh, enter the South China Sea without going through uh, northern Luzon, we can do. And this is actually the case that uh, um, the uh, forecast track of Mark Cruz a few days earlier on. Um, the model suggests actually um, the Mark Cruz will go through the one the sun straight and then going uh, well pretty close to uh, Hong Kong uh, on that Sunday on the 16th of September. And what will happen that according to our model this is this prediction and uh, the harbor uh, it will um, around 4.7. That is about a, bit, a meter higher than the actually uh, report um, at that time, three, three <coughs> nine. And how about the um, total other? It will even rise to uh, 6.8. Yeah, 6.8. That is uh, uh, more than two meters, two meters higher than uh, uh, what we have reported uh, at the station. And, um, one other thing you may come back. Um, actually, the high tide uh, will happen um, uh, several hours later. If um, my group uh, is lower and uh, did not work in on the account of the song and uh, coincide with the arrival of the high tide, um, the, tide uh, the total sea level in the Victoria Harbor will easily get beyond uh, about five meters and, uh, and more than seven meters in the total. And uh, so, uh, one step uh, we, we, we did uh, one step further uh, to, to uh, look at um, the possible uh, practical extent um, associated with my group. Um, this is what happened uh, now, um, according based on the um, actual uh, sea levels recorded over Hong Kong. And uh, Carlos shows the um, uh, areas that um, will be threatened. This is we use here with a simple uh, method, the bank of the coach, which means that uh, whenever the uh, sea level is higher than the, uh, the elevation of a uh, particular location, we'll calculate the difference, and this that will be the drop depth for uh, that uh, will indicate that the place will be dropped uh, due to the sea intrusion of sea water. But what happened if uh, So what happened to other parts of the world uh, in uh, 2018? Uh, um, so it probably you still remember uh, in, again in September uh, the, the Tanjung Jetty uh, bashing uh, uh, Japan in Osaka and um, according to JMA the Japan Meteorological um, Administration uh, it was the strongest storm in 25 years and a record high storm surge uh, was reported uh, at station of uh, Osaka and um, this is the uh, picture uh, of the uh, Brooklyn in the uh, Kansai National Airport, uh, well, um, uh, which is started in the closure of the airport for a week or so. And then, um, um, actually, uh, in October, um, Hurricane Michael. And before that, um, someone also mentioned the Hurricane Florence. And uh, this one is uh, another, um, the, 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 uh, another hurricane. 
which may lack for all the uh, probably the um, this is the picture um, near the left hole point of uh, Mexico Beach uh, uh, in uh, Florida. And um, the peak wings of uh, this uh, earth is about uh, 250 kilometers per hour. Here we talk about uh, one minute average because uh, the United States use uh, one minute average. In Hong Kong, we, 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 uh, speak, uh, uh, we use 10 minutes average uh, uh, wind speed. If you want to apply a conversion, um, you can make a seven uh, percent discount from this figure to convert into a seven minute average. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a very strong um, uh, storm for the United States. It is supposed to be uh, the third strongest um, hurricane, making landfall on the uh, US. But uh, what happened? Uh, and just a few days ago, the uh, uh, super time is YouTube. Uh, the record was overtaken already by YouTube. And uh, with, uh, uh, the winds are uh, packing um, winds up to 290 kilometers per hour. And on that day, it um, uh, barreled across uh, the uh, northern uh, Mariana Islands. And uh, it now claimed uh, to be the first uh, most intense land for tropical cyclone. And uh, it was the strongest since uh, uh, 1969. And um, well, although um, the damage to the islands uh, are yet to be find out, but uh, um, due to its character, uh, according to the uh, um, the strategy, will um, move towards the uh, Luzon. Hopefully, it will be uh, not bringing uh, any more. You may have something in mind. Um, one storms are getting uh, stronger than the other ones. Uh, the storms are getting more intense. So before going into that, uh, 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 we'll also give you some uh, background information about the uh, annual counts uh, based on the past study uh, about the tropical cyclones um, um, attaining a tropical storm intensity uh, in the northwestern uh, Pacific. And uh, basically, you, you find that uh, after 1970s, there is a trend that the uh, number of, number of uh, counts of the tropical cyclones are, uh, well, show a gradually declining trend. Uh, but that is not a statistical, uh, statistically significant at the 5%. Um, for another study um, about uh, tropical cyclones attacking Hong Kong, we also find a similar trend um, from the 1960s. Um, also a slight increasing trend. But on average, we have um, um, every year about uh, six uh, tropical cyclones coming in 500 uh, kilometers of Hong Kong. So, um, but how about the intensity? There is uh, um, another study in 2016, a million um, Basically, um, if, uh, the other chart shows the peak uh, intensity during the whole life whole lifetime of the uh, uh, tropical cyclones within the region. And uh, the bottom one shows the trend of the um, peak um, intensification rate of these uh, tropical cyclones, both uh, showing a, 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 a gradually increasing trend, indicating that the idea is that the tropical cyclones are indeed getting uh, more intense. And um, as also mentioned by uh, Professor Chang, uh, you, we know that uh, more than 90% uh, of the heat uh, have, have, has been absorbed into the ocean water. And uh, this is the, um, um, the global ocean heat content so called the OHC, um, starting from 1940 till uh, 2018. And um, actually, um, well, um, that, 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 that's been a new record set in the first part of uh, 2018. Uh, in fact, uh, basically after uh, 1991 or 1990, uh, basically the record has been set uh, every year. So we are now uh, at an all-time high um, in terms of the global ocean heat content. And uh, as you know, the ocean provides the fuel uh, for the uh, tropical cyclones to do. So um, it's not um, it's natural that we uh, now see uh, more 
more intense than proper sound counts. And uh, when looking back uh, to the uh, report uh, by uh, AFI uh, by uh, IBCC, this is the uh, global picture of the trend of the um, charcoal cycle activity. And um, the first part show the um, the uh, charcoal cycle frequency, and uh, second and three basically show the um, frequency uh, uh, um, the intensity or how intense the charcoal cycles will be. Um, the last one is about the precipitation rate associated with the charcoal storms. Basically, in particular for the um, You may also see this figure uh, in last presentation uh, from ALI. Um, one thing we learned uh, from different uh, studies is that it's in basically the consensus is that it's virtually certain that the sea level will continue to rise beyond 2100. And uh, if, um, well, of course, the rate or the magnitude will depend on the uh, future emission pathways. And um, when we look at the high scenarios, the high gas concentration scenario, um, the rate is talking about uh, what, more than uh, uh, one meter in 100 meters. And can be as much as uh, 10 to 30 uh, meters as mentioned by uh, Dr. Yang just now. Um, so with all that, uh, we should be aware of the rise in uh,
So um, with all that, we, we should be um, we prepared for seeing more and more significant cost reduction coming ahead. So this is a summary about the, um, the effects of, of um, climate change. Uh, um,
for the same physical hazard, basically whether it's heavy rain or uh, sea level rise or other thing, uh, that physical hazard, how much risk uh, eventually it will, how much damage it will create. It's not just the hazard itself. It also depends on two other uh, parts. One is the uh, exposure, whether you have a lot of asset or a lot of uh, potential uh, people around there that is exposed to that hazard. And then in addition, whether those exposed assets are vulnerable. Uh, vulnerability actually depends on the social economic uh, uh, condition. Uh, if the society is more uh, developed, better prepared, they are less vulnerable. With the same hazard, you can reduce the potential risk. So I actually want to demonstrate or talk a little bit about using a uh, recent example to, to talk about this. Uh, so, well, sea level rise, uh, I think, this is one of the figures I want to highlight. Uh, Pearl River Delta is very prone to uh, flooding. Uh, even with this is not because of the beer break. This is uh, just from 2005, one of the, it's just because of particularly high tide uh, in Guangzhou. This is, uh, uh, 100,000 people, <laughs> they don't have to go to school because of tidal uh, situation. So this is not heavy rain, it's not because of any storm surge, it's just high tide, uh, astronomically high tide. But this again tells us that how vulnerable, how, how the region is actually quite susceptible to uh, sea level rise or storm surge uh, in terms of damage. Uh, the return period, I don't think I will go into uh, Professor Jang has already demonstrated calculation. A small increase in sea level can shorten the return period very significantly. Okay? So you can have uh, in actually in this example, actually we try to okay, try to look at this uh, in terms of when you have the sea level rise for a small change, how much the uh, return period can shorten, okay? So, uh, but actually, just talking about return period shorten, sometimes doesn't get a feel of, what does it mean if I have a 100 year event, okay? Because, okay, everyone knows that 100 year event is more severe, but how severe it is, Actually, we had done a study uh, to look at if you are a uh, hundred year event, if you don't do anything or suddenly it happens, what is the potential damage? Okay, so that's actually the uh, bigger part of my talk here. Uh, what does it mean to have a hundred year event? Okay, so the data set that we use is used a uh, global archive of large, uh, there's uh, Dartmouth Flood Observatory has large flood event uh, database. Basically, they start a lot earlier before the social media, but this is like uh, they use social media information to build a database that talk about, okay, in terms of this flood, how long the flood has, how many people die, how many people are affected, what is the damage in US dollar? Uh, what is the cause of the flood? Severity class here is very similar to what we want to talk about because they define it in terms of different severity class, like class one is something like around a 20 year flood. Uh, class two is something larger than a 100 year flood, okay? Uh, they also have data about uh, what is the area that is affected in this flood? Uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, work on this, and then what we combine this and actually define something called flood magnitude. Uh, basically, a combination of three parameters the severity, duration, and area. Uh, 
So the data set actually is very comprehensive. They have about 4,000 flood around, uh, not just because of storm surge, all different types of flood around the world. And it has all this information. So we try to look at, okay, how is the size of the flood related to the damages, the death, and all this type of thing, okay? Uh, the data set actually identifies not just the flood, but also where it occurred, what type of, uh, what kind. So we can actually categorize it by country. Unfortunately, they do not have it by city. Uh, they have it by country. So this is like China. Uh, remember, we have this flood magnitude we defined, but basically, when you have higher magnitude, uh, you can see that there are more damage, and this is number of death. Okay. Uh, we kind of can fit a line with the axis going from zero, uh, forcing it to go to zero here, and then just use 90% of this ellipse of it. Uh, what you find is that when you compare different countries, like in the U.S. and in China, for the same severity, what you find is more people die in China, uh, possibly because there's more vulnerable, uh, because of social economic uh, preparation or other things is different. Okay, so we can actually look at how vulnerable it is for similar type of flood in different places. Uh, we can actually do this uh, for different countries. This is for USA, uh, Japan, China, India. Uh, not just the number of people killed, but uh, how many people get affected. Uh, in, and in addition, what is the economic loss? Okay, and by looking at this, we also can look at the dependence. How, what are the parameters controlling the slope of this, which is the most important parameter? So we also use the uh, use WDI World Economic uh, Indicator to say, okay, is there uh, any dependence between this damage rate and some of its uh, economic and uh, social economic index? And we find that actually there's relationship like. Uh, in terms of well, death, uh, actually the rural population percentage is a very important indicator of how many people will uh, die. Uh, if you have more people in the rural population, it actually has a higher uh, percentage. Um, in terms of how many uh, people display, uh, the population density is the most important. That's quite uh, easy to understand when you have more people, you get more affected. Economic damage is actually quite interesting because the GDP per capita and how many telephone lines uh, per 100 people has the largest indication. Basically, if uh, you have a more developed economy, the economic damage is much larger. And we also see that uh, for developing countries, they have more people die, they have more people displayed, but in terms of actual economic loss, it's less than the developed country. Developed country, the infrastructure are very expensive, and then the damage, although they don't have a lot of people killed, but economic loss is huge, okay? Well, here is something we have to look at is, okay, if we just look at right now, in terms of uh, return period, Looking in Hong Kong, we use Hong Kong basically using the economic indicator from that uh, analysis, and then we can estimate. Okay, if you have a uh, a annual flood, uh, what is the number of people? This is just an estimate from the uh, analysis. So it's not really a lot when you look at 2000 year 2000 when we have a uh, annual flood, okay? But when sea level are rising, the annual flood that we see in later year is actually what we will use it to be seeing as a longer term. Like, if we look at 
uh, a rise in sea level of like 2100 when the uh, projected sea level rise is about uh, somewhere between half to uh, 80 centimeter, then this equivalent uh, return period that we now uh, basically have uh, is around 20 to 100 years. And if we have this type of sea level rise, this event will become an annual situation. Okay, that's basically what Professor Jack has already explained. If the sea level rise this much, what we see as a 100 year event may come on an annual basis. What is the type of economic loss that we are talking about? Well, this is $6 billion per year. Okay? And this, uh, I don't know whether you consider this is fake or not, but this is a really a large number. In terms of number of people killed, well, Hong Kong, we, the potential, if you're using this type of analysis, it will be uh, quite uh, dramatic. Uh, this is Hong Kong, and Hong Kong, if you look at the sea level, uh, in terms of the location here, uh, the uh, red area is actually the urban uh, area, which is over the Pearl River Delta. This is uh, this morning we talked about the Greater Bay Area. Basically, it's over here, and this whole area has something like, depending on which study you are talking about, 15 to 17 million people in this area. Okay, Hong Kong is right around here. Uh, here, what we have stated the kind of light blue area is the water area. The deeper blue area is the lower lying area. Uh, if the, uh, any type of storm surge or flooding of four meter, this is four meter about existing sea level, not about data. Okay, not about chart data. It's a little bit about the. You would see that, well, Hong Kong may not have a lot of place, but it's still, but you can see a majority of the Pearl River Delta area, this flooding will be quite severe, okay? And a lot of our food, a lot of our uh, water, or many uh, essentials are actually coming from this area, okay? If this area is flooded, then the impact for Hong Kong is actually quite significant. Actually, uh, this analysis, we can also estimate the recovery duration for a 100-year uh, event, uh, potentially, well, if you don't do anything before. Uh, if you look at other places like uh, Thailand, it takes quite a few months to get it back to normal. Okay, or even if you think about just two weeks of Pearl River Delta uh, being flooded, uh, or it cannot return to normal operation, then the impact in Hong Kong is actually quite significant. Okay, so here is bank steps. Okay, I want to highlight this is without adaptation. Okay, but it doesn't mean that we can't do anything, although these numbers are quite large. Uh, but it's very similar if you look at this is the World Bank's estimate uh, looking at major coastal areas. Actually, I don't know how many people uh, in this area know Guangzhou or the Pearl River Delta area is identified by the World Bank as the number one risk area with the damage at around uh, 600 million US dollars. Okay, so which is about the same order of what we kind of estimated from the analysis, okay? So here, first, the first summary is that, well, there will be very significant impact and we need to work on that. But the, here, I want to highlight is not just this number, but actually there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, even if Hong Kong is not susceptible, uh, vulnerable in sea level rise per, per se, but we need to think about the surrounding area because we depend on this so much. Okay, uh, I will skip this, but we talk about the uh, mangrove, the recent typhoon. 
there's a lot of talk about how we are kind of lucky because if it's not, we can open the Philippines if it is nearer and then if it moves slower or the tide is not at uh, such a low level, we will have much more damage. Actually, I think that this is most important, that we don't have worse damage. Because last year, we had Hong Kong. And the whole region, not just Hong Kong, the whole region kind of understand how a strong typhoon can do to the uh, community. And the whole region actually prepared much better. Without Hector, I don't know whether people will respect uh, the stock as much as the whole society has really prepared and come together in preparation of bankruptcy. And I think, but this also tells us that if we really improve our vulnerability, we can reduce the damage. Okay? Uh, one very simple example is if you look at this is the wind we measure in at the university. Okay, this is uh, since 1999 uh, we have a wind station. Uh, this is York 1999. This is uh, the red is the banquet. This is the recent uh, storm. The blue one is last year's uh, storm uh, measured in Hong Kong. You can see that last year's storm is much weaker than this year's. Okay? If everything the same, you would expect damage in terms of people casualty or things, maybe more this year. But that's not true. Okay? In terms of casualty, for mainland, for Macau and well, Hong Kong, we didn't change and we didn't have any. But Macau last year had 12 people killed. This time, there's no one killed. Okay? Why is it like that? It's because the vulnerability has been reduced. Okay? I think that is the point. I think we need to understand and prepare. Uh, it's very lucky in the sense that the storm, the second the recent storm come right one year after last year. And everyone still remember that one very well. In particular, in Macau, they even closed the casino for this storm. Okay? But, so what we need is really learn from experience. Hopefully, uh, actually, we learn from Macau's story, I think. It's not just learning from ourselves. Learn from Macau. So, in the sense, we really need to look at, in terms of these extremes, what are the damage modes? Some of these damage modes may not be readily understood. Here is an example, like in uh, Paris, their heat wave kills uh, 14,000, well, they attributed for 14,000 premature death in France, okay? And it's only two weeks of hot weather, and the so-called hot weather is not that hot, it's around 30 <laughs> degrees, right? <laughs> but the city was not designed for it. The uh, government's advice to the uh, puppet was not right. They asked people to stay home, because that was the old way of doing it. Okay? The, the heat wave don't use it to last that long. Okay? After they do the analysis, they uh, have a national heat warning system and then have some cooling center. Similar episode happened in 2009, and there's much, much less reported casualty. Okay? This is a very, very long example of, well, if we understand how something will happen and we can strategically plan in terms of how to deal with it, it actually can do a lot of uh, good to the community. Rather than, this is smart adaptation. Okay? It's not really about, well, rethinking uh, infrastructure is necessary. I'm not saying that everything can be done by smart infrastructure. But it's really, uh, in terms of like, well, we hope that people don't go to car park, underground car park, where there's a typhoon. I think that message, again, we learn 
Okay, so this type of bank typing is necessary. Uh, this I don't talk about. Uh, Chicago has total, and this is something again which they do not recognize. But this comes from climate change. Uh, for Hong Kong, I think we still have to learn more. In this particular time, we have the storm. Uh, the day after the storm, we say the roads is okay, the bus start going down. But the roads was okay for the uh, small vehicles. The bus, some of the roads are not really clear for the bus. So a lot of the bus get, uh, when they go out, they actually hit the trees. Uh, only one person get hurt. Uh, but a large number of us was damaged. Okay, so again, this is new. I, I, I don't think it's anyone's fault. It is just lessons that we don't understand. We need to collect more information like this, put it in a database, and learn from each other, so that we don't make the same type of mistake again. I think this is how sharing with different uh, cities will really help us. Uh, well, again, uh, this is UST, uh, our damage. We never thought that a storm will do this type of damage. When we look at this, we thought that, well, is there an earthquake? <laughs> yeah, but certainly, uh, I guess our civil engineering uh, department colleagues know this very well, but at least myself did not expect that. Okay, but this is the last, kind of the last line, uh, second last line. I think in terms of preparation, we really need to uh, use different type of method. This is an IPCC uh, guideline in terms of how to prepare for extreme weather. Identify the vulnerability, uh, and establish some decision making uh, guidelines. Basically, and this through practice and analysis, we can enhance this so that we can strengthen our adaptability and we see this. I think that is something we need to be doing uh, more. So the risk and adaptation, uh, what we can see here is failure across system is highly nonlinear and very difficult to fail. Uh, we, we should try to understand them, but thinking that we can predict them, all, the, all of them is just, uh, I think, to idealistic. But we need to learn, and we should learn and try to understand them when we have small damages. So we have a few uh, tens of buses damage this time. We learn from there, and then we don't do the we don't have the same error, or we have a more defective uh, tree cutting system uh, next time. So here it's very important establish early warning system, enhance monitoring. With rapid analysis, we capture small failure and then prepare this, basically have system prepare for it. So that when next time when an even better event happens, we already understand that and prepare for it. I think that is something, I guess, from the adaptation and resilience point of view. It's not just sea level rise, it's all the extreme event things that we talk about. So, well, adaptation. This type of adaptation, I, I would call, we need to be smart, well planned, and coordinated. I'm not saying that this can handle everything. Okay, there are a lot of things we need to rethink the resilience of the infrastructure. But before we do that, we need to do also this type of smart uh, capturing, understanding, learning from other cities. We learned from last year's uh, case in Macau. Okay, don't go to underground parking. <laughs> well, it's, it's said that uh, that caused life for us to learn, but we need to have this type of understanding. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. So, <laughs> yes, uh, while we are uh, reconfiguring the room, go grab your coffee. I think the, the, the idea is to turn the, the seat uh, by 180 degrees. So we have three types of seat. Maybe this group will turn this, this way, this group turn this way, and then we kind of uh, 
the moderator can kind of have a discussion rather than a uh, we can sit around this table, is that okay? You can sit on the table. On the table, yeah, but I mean how many people in the room?
think really, um, from my perspective, that, that a lot of uh, infrastructure um, things are putting really professionally. And we benefited from it that uh, you know, the self-evident evidence part is that, that there was no casualty for the recent type of now. But we cannot be complacent. Because uh, the, uh, the the figures on the information is quite overwhelming, but the severity is getting uh, uh, increasingly uh, uh, cannot be comprehended. So, can we say that uh, you know, judging from what we have now, that uh, is good enough for the future? Probably not. But uh, if the subject area is so complex, predictions are uh, highly uncertain. Um, what can we do from the uh, preparedness, adaptation, or uh, what we learned from the past that uh, can we do it smarter? Or in terms of investment, uh, I'm well aware that uh, you know something to share with you. Before the government do anything, sometimes. Because sometimes, you know, there the, 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 the may be counter uh, criticism or uh, idea from the government that uh, I'm not saying that it will, but that some people would say, hey, we do we did very well. Why do more? It, 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 then then I, I think that's not the message, but uh, um, should we do more? Or where should we, which area should we concentrate? Structure, uh, warning system. What should we do? Um, can, can I ask a question? What what mechanisms do we have in Hong Kong for sort of post event analysis? So I spent many years working in the aviation industry, and any time there's a near miss of any sort, it's sort of mandatory to report it. And to a significant extent, there's a no blame culture. So you report, you know, if you our pilot and you have a near miss, you report it because everybody wants to be aware of that. So they, why did it happen? How do we make sure that sort of incident doesn't happen again? Because next time the planes could collide. Now, what mechanism do we have for looking at doing a post-event analysis on this particular severe typhoon coming through Hong Kong to find out what near misses there were? Where were people nearly killed or you know, the, the buses having problems, etc.? and then analyzing it so that we are prepared for the future. The problem we have, I think, in Hong Kong is we have a blame culture. We have the Legislative Council whose members seem to have their major occupation of seeing how can they give a government official a hard time. That's how they get re-elected. And we want to move from a blame culture to a no-blame culture so that we can be transparent about the near misses and learn from them. How do we do that? Surely there was no deaths in Hong Kong because all the houses, all the village houses are made in reinforced concrete. All the rooms are made in reinforced concrete. All the other buildings are made in reinforced concrete. You look at the streets, they're all made of wood. They obviously don't have the story of the people of the streets there. And they just make their houses out of sticks.
the scientific method is by looking at uh, data, looking at experience, and we generate learning. And I think this is very important when we basically uh, this morning's talk is about our reality is changing. Basically, reality is changing, and we need to learn what the new reality is. And sometimes it's very difficult for us. Uh, we, we never think about uh, possible things.
by reservation that can host a million people. Okay? Remember, in the middle of the sea, four kilometers away from shore, by reclamation, I mean from sea level, to have a city with a million people plus. That's what the government is proposing. Now, so to those who see, here's what the Hong Kong government is going to do. Let me pose you a question. Uh, I'm going to have a poll to ask you. Is that a good idea? Anyone who thinks good idea, please raise your hand. One person. Two. Good idea, right? There are about 60 people in the room. So, 58 people think it's a bad idea. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I don't wait, 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 wait. Let me finish my question. <laughs> let me finish my question. No, I, I, let me finish my question. Okay. So, is that a good idea? It's a good discussion. If not, if you design a city from scratch for the future, knowing what you know now, would you design and that design? Would you do design in 30 years, 50 years, 100 years? We're facing the scenario we saw today, and we're seeing the damage we've seen in the last year or two. So as a designer, with the data you have in provision, would you design such a city in the middle of a sea to house a million people, five kilometers from shore, and have three or four tunnels for evacuation, emergency, and all the emergency operations, just conceptually. So you didn't discuss this question, okay? Now, I can call a vote again, if you think it's not fair, but let's discuss. Well, so specifically, what is your question? Well, the question is, is that a good idea? Now, you have limited information, right? I'm reducing the essence of the issue. A design in the middle of a sea, about 17 square kilometers square, that house a million people at sea level, four kilometers away from shore. That's the essence of the design. So okay, let's discuss. Okay, so I was one of the two people who put my hand up. So can I give a counter argument? We were told this morning that when CO2 level in the atmosphere was the same as it is today, three million years ago, sea level was 10 to 30 meters higher than today. How are we going to develop Hong Kong so it can cope with that? One possibility is that we will do for the city area of Hong Kong what we've done for Pulver Cove, but in reverse. We will put barrages across certain, you know, you know Limon Gap, um, Hong Kong Lam Lama, Lantau, so that we end up with a area, the, the valuable city area, which a bit like the Dutch, we have below the future sea level. So it makes sense to me to develop in that sort of area, rather than, for instance, to develop in Yun Long, which where you can't protect it that way. Uh, so you're saying that uh, with investment, with the technology, all the problems can be solved, right? No. What I'm saying is that if we wish to maintain a city of Hong Kong into the distant future, when sea levels, when it may not be so distant, when sea levels are perhaps 30 meters higher than today, we need to think about which area it's going to be economically viable to protect against the higher sea level. So the city area we've got, south of the Kowloon Hills, probably yes. The area north of that, I suspect not. So you're suggesting it's easier uh, to avoid storm surge on land, and then, I mean, you, you're saying, we're saying that it's, uh, it's uh, easier to protect storm surge in the middle of the sea compared to the land? No, I'm saying, if you, look at, if you look at the map of Hong Kong, no, and are you, you saying, are you saying that in the middle of the sea, a piece of land in the middle of the sea? Can I say what I'm saying? Oh. Yes. Can, can I just say, yes, I am a designer, I design sea walls and decorations, and it's obvious if you can design them as high as you want to. And you can design them so that in future you can make them higher still. At what cost? Well, At what cost? Well, the, the cost of reclamation isn't that high, it's as long as you can get the plan from China. <laughs> well, but, there's, but, there's, there's also a threshold. It's always a threshold. Um, yes, but the threshold. I, I guess, I guess uh, you know, this is an interesting question that we looked at the question. But if there are more debate on this question, so, uh, to let you guys uh, discuss in other venue or something. But then I'd like
like to hear more from others than that. I, I, I saw a hand just now over here. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask the uh, services department, is it, is it the government's policy to protect everybody in low-lying areas? Or well, is, is, is there, can we follow that up, is there flexibility for people to protect themselves? Just uh, to recap, we uh, try to promote the flood adaptation, flood resilience, and the flood proof concept. That means maybe we try to raise the awareness of the public that everybody may need to have such a uh, concept of the flooding. That means, in case, just in case, this sea level rise will continue to rise, uh, maybe even worse than IPCC, AR6, AR5, because uh, projection. That means the low lying area, uh, uh, the shoreline of Hong Kong will have a high risk of flooding. Well, uh, of course, we can have uh, structural measures uh, you can build. But uh, I think at this moment, we need to uh, set up some uh, action plan and all for them. Uh, such as now, right now, we have uh, prepared for the numbers of low lying areas, including the Taiwan, uh, Lady Moon. That means we have a early alert system and we know what is happening or what will happen and what can we do such as to uh, minimize the damage caused by the uh, extreme event such as typhoon and the recovery time. We need to shorten the recovery time for those uh, uh, areas. Yes, uh, I think now uh, We are planning to carry out a strategic service to uh, review the low-lying areas, uh, which is subject to strong wind. Uh, we focus on the storm surges, waves, and other climate change events. And uh, it will help to uh, facilitate us to formulate some uh, adaptive and resilience measures uh, in the short term, medium term, and long term. I think this is a structural approach we are going to push through in, uh, uh, from the government perspective. And priority, of course, it will be given to those areas which the, uh, the lives are susceptible to the likelihood of risk. Thank you. If I may, this is a good uh, piece of information, but if I may, uh, in light of the uh, severe storm we just encountered for this uh, couple of years, you know, I keep hearing this, um, you know, turning it into a 100 years event, into every year's event. Now, does it change the thinking? Because what, what you are just saying is that uh, that is your normal practice, but uh, would there be some new thinking in terms of the year severe storms now? That uh, in terms of Reviewing the design menu or the coastal area of Hong Kong uh, in terms of uh, new measures. Uh, uh, would there be uh, new money, new project, new thinking of dealing with it? Because uh, the business as usual case probably did not be, uh, account for the uh, severe storms we just encountered for this uh, couple of years. Thank you. Uh, actually, early this year, uh, CDD has uh, updated its uh, progress design menu to take into account the uh, uh, new latest uh, AR5 on the uh, seawater rise, extreme water level, etc. Uh, we are happy to study, to carry out some more studies on the, such as the uh, frequency of uh, extreme weather conditions and the forecast of wind in collaboration with farm parties, for example, Hong Kong Observatory. So then we have uh, more more data, more data so that we can reveal our design menu so that for the new coastal infrastructure, we can adopt uh, uh, 
still adaptive backward approach to uh, to carry out some design so that we can build our strategy more strong. We organized the workshop. Uh, I, I guess uh, it's certainly true that adaptation and resilience need to involve uh, really the entire government and almost entire society. Uh, but I think uh, this has been a lot of discussion about conferences, about mitigation. Uh, one of the reasons we really uh, want to talk about adaptation and resilience, and in the beginning when we organized the uh, conference, we make it very specific. We want to exclude mitigation. It's because we want to change the current discussion uh, dynamics in Hong Kong. And uh, I, I would say that from a organizing or conference perspective, uh, talking about adaptation and resilience, this is kind of in the beginning. Uh, we expect and we hope that uh, we can have more government department or other professional bodies joining in this effort. So uh, the fact that they are not here today, I would think that uh, is remind us that maybe next time we will try better to also involve them uh, in the discussion. But uh, it's really just a start. Uh, I would think that uh, I wouldn't necessarily, maybe it's our uh, our problem that we did not really go out and try to involve them. Uh, we have involved more in terms of the engineering department, the works department this time. Uh, so it's not necessary that uh, they don't come just because they don't want to come. Yeah. Follow on question. Um, in, in, if we are if, if we are, as seems likely, faced with long-term sea level rise, there will be some areas of Hong Kong where the sensible policy is to abandon them rather than try and protect them. Who makes that decision? I, I suspect it's not the Drake, it, it's not CEDD. You know, it's their job to protect it if, if people say so. Uh, it's not their job to tell people, sorry, we're abandoning this bit. Whose job is it? Before we answer this question, I mean, I'm not, I'm not from Hong Kong, but I think this question to throw out is, is the knowledge well enough to support this kind of policy making? Because as we've been hearing, listening to the talk, regional, in particular, if you zoom into the Hong Kong area, you try to predict the, the sea level rise, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. So the question is, uh, what kind of scientific knowledge or preparation have been ready? Uh, speaking of the stop search, the, 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 the forecast is similarly equally difficult. 
So this is the kind of a question uh, uh, we should answer before we can lead into the policy making. I would say, although I, I fully agree, this uh, it's never too late to start to engage communication, to do the research, because what we have been hearing uh, today about the typhoon, storm surge, flooding stuff, it has been held happening in the world elsewhere for many, many years. And the climate change has been talking in the society for many years. And Hong Kong, I think, should have been leading some of because it's one of the leading cities in, in Asia, at least. So this is also the, the one of the reflection Hong Kong community or government or from the bottom up uh, society could refresh from those uh, last year's super typhoon, this year's super typhoon, or this conference. But again, this is an extremely good opportunity to start to get engaged and communicate with each other. Can I add that this is part? Uh, I also saw that today that the, the sea level in Victoria Harbor. Before 1990, it's almost flat. 1990, jump up, and then the kingdom almost flat. Why 1990 jump up? We need to answer this question. It's because they are particularly warmer, or because we do that, we did that reclamation, such that the, our overall capacity of the tide receiving ocean tides is decreasing. Now, this is a fundamental question. If you plot the time series before 1990, after 1990, and then a jump, of course, the trend is increasing. I'm not saying that we don't have any risk. This is a first thing, uh, and I agree with uh, Professor Dai that uh, we, before we jump that, uh, I think that the science, for well, science, we never get that uh, accurate, uh, you know, the go to that, you know, the, 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 the expectation we needed. Uh, but without science, as Professor Dai said, we, without sustainability, this is the number one. Number two, here we're talking about the wind, actually, the southwesterly wind, the monsoon. Is decreasing. Now, if people know that the hydrodynamics of the ocean, that Hong Kong is a coastal city, once the southwesterly wind decreasing, the upwarding, that means that upwarding, we probably don't know as a report, but it's a, that means the sea level actually will increase. Okay, because the, you know, the wind from this way that will bring the water up south, southwest. But this sounds like, uh, you know, the bad news. Uh, or good news because the, you know it, it will increase. But then the same thing that here in the winter time, downwarding wind, that means the northeasterly wind here, is also weaker. Okay, this is the recently I write the I'm responsible for one chapter in so-called the National Climate Report for China Sea Physics Part. So southward northeasterly wind also weakening. That means that we uh, reduce the sea level increase because the opposite direction, okay, this is a physics in the coastal water. So these two things, all this thing is not clear. When I write that report at the end, I found that the previous, the many of the research study is not clear. Some of them is a contradiction with the other, and some of them not even have a physical sense. Okay, now it, we, we know that, that, that. and also the uh, Professor Zhang earlier say that, that, you know, the the city, the sea level increase. It is one of the most uh, difficult uh, problem in the, uh, in the IPCC, that kind of a task. Particularly in the coastal one, we have a lot of the change of the coastal line. We have a uh, coastal line change. Uh, Chen, uh, Mr. Chen also from this care also said that relating to the, uh, you know, the coastal line change. Uh, depends where you are, the, the, the water level will be the same. And that is also the, you know, the Quite of the uh, things that we need to uh, also address. So, in other words, uh, but the conclusion is from the tidal gauge along the coastal line of China, the sea level is increased, particularly in the northern part. The northern part increase, I think, is due to the steric effect, increase more. The reason is because the air is colder. Once the air temperature is increased, they receive a more heat. That means the warming is more significant in the northern part than the southern part because you are already warm relatively warmer. So you can see that those uh, tidal gauge along the coast. But it also depends on where you put the tidal gauge. Okay, so this uh, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, the, 
why are we talking about adaptation? I think this is very important. I like the what Alex is uh, today is saying that we need to prepare like a Macau case. But meanwhile, this community, Hong Kong, we need to also to enhance the research understanding of this kind of global the climate change impact on region, Pearl River Delta, Hong Kong region, such that uh, you know that we can be prepared in right way or at least relatively right way, rather than the, you know the rush to do something that uh, you know the uh, no we will regret later. On. Okay. Now also another thing uh, is. Is that recently you have a Pearl River, the, you know, the bridge, okay, uh, between the Macau, Zhuhai, and Hong Kong. I just look at the map. They have uh, so many artificial uh, islands there. It actually changes the water, the pathway. And we, well, we have a project now called Study the Eutrophication, tomorrow's uh, uh, topics, that we found out that, that the eutrophication and hypoxia, hypoxia means uh, no oxygen in the bottom, the kill everything. And eventually you will smell something, including the Tory Harbor. And you can see the government's data showing now is decreasing. Okay. Now, those artificial the, uh, islands, are they affecting or causing this problem? We don't know. Okay, but this is overall the thinking, and not to mention the reason that we're talking about the reclamation. So all these things that we combine together, and I think that before I fully agree with the professor that before we do that, we will try this community, academic, not academic, uh, combine together to build up the best, uh, you know, the knowledge, okay, and such that we can do the something uh, like uh, you know, IPCC is also built up of the science, the best uh, possible science they can get. Here. Now IPCC model in our region, I don't think that it's quite that convinced, particularly in South China Sea, because it is a marginal sea. Okay, marginal sea means uh, semi close So the motor resolution there, you know, that is almost 100 kilometers. Hong Kong, only at one spot. Okay, so we 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 have uh, the kind of the evidence showing that they're not doing quite well here. I wouldn't say, want to, don't want to say that it's not doing wrong, but it's not doing well here. So can we completely realize on that? kind of the results. Okay, IPCC also admit that. They said that we cannot do it that well in the coast in the regional ocean. Okay, global, they can do it, the open ocean, they can do it. I'm doing the oceanography, so I numerical ocean modeling, so I know all these kind of uncertainties inside. So we need to, you know, what, what I'm trying to emphasize is that we should in strengthen our, enhance our, you know, the research and uh, you know, investigation. This is my key point. And also, uh, meanwhile, while we are doing the, you know, the other things. Okay. I am in total agreement with you that uh, before we make any decision, we should do more research. And this is, I think, today is a very good uh, gathering uh, uh, engagement. Um, that uh, not necessary. We have other solutions uh, of the things we talk about, but I think uh, at least this is the start. Um, because you know, I, I think Hong Kong uh, is benefiting from uh, a lot of new things uh, happening in the world. But also, I think in the morning, the first panel, uh, I listened.
Thank you, Peter. I'm, uh, I'm from the NTR Corporation. Um, so thank you, Alexis, for, uh, and the USD team for moving this discussion to adaptation. I think it's very important that we start really talking more about adaptation. But the reason why I chose to come to this workshop uh, is for two reasons. One, most of my colleagues have chosen the other three and we wanted to come <laughs> Data point coincidentally yesterday, um, the UK's Committee on Climate Change published a 74 page report on uh, the coastline um, and it does an analysis of all the it's about 1.2 million homes that are impacted well, by, by their projection 2080, how much railway line, how many landfills, etc., etc., around the whole coast of the UK. And uh, one of the recommendations plans to manage and adapt, specific shorelines need to be prepared to overcome over the coming century, and they should be realistic and sustainable in economic, social, and environmental terms. So you, you, well, they need a long-term plan as to which areas they're going to protect and how, and which areas they're going to abandon, and how they're going to communicate with the communities who are going to have to move. saying that Engineering 
solutions as well. I, someone told me that I'm a scientist by training, that uh, if you give enough money, enough time, there's always engineering, engineering solutions, you know. Um, so, so I think uh, we, we need not rush into things, but I, I know that they are pressing problems. But uh, we need some lasting or, or uh, solid uh, foundation before we move on. Um, so, so in, in fact, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm happy to report that the interdepartment, uh, departmental working groups uh, 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 headed by the Security Bureau is not just uh, something for, for the press input uh, from different uh, aspects. Yeah, uh, from, uh, for example, the you know, stakeholder, science, and uh, you know, the across the yeah. board. Yeah. Across yeah. the board. Uh, Hong Kong as a civil society, I think uh, consultation certainly is a very important way of collecting information. And I think as an uh, academic myself always, I, I, uh, maybe learning from Christine, uh, I think there are many other ways that we can express our views. Uh, also working with professional organizations, working with government uh, for publishing papers. Uh, although you may not think that papers are uh, taken seriously by the government, but I'm, uh, I have an experience. I, I remember something like Twelve years ago, we published a certain paper saying that the ship emissions is very important for Hong Kong, and that was not the real effort for the government at that time. And then they actually sent people and come and talk to me and try to better understand the whole situation. Uh, I guess the difference is uh, maybe for different people, they have diff different. Uh, how fast the government responds is sometimes not. Want. We sometimes we have some really burning issues. We want the government to actually uh, face it or manage it. But uh, I always see that the government as a balancing act against different interests as well as they need to think about not just one sector. But uh, up to this point, I still feel that I work with uh, different government groups. I still think that. Uh, they are with the will of how to make Hong Kong better. And it may not be running as fast as some of the NGOs, which 
I also pushed the government a lot on the air quality issues. But uh, I see there's multiple ways of uh, input. Like the current ATO review may not be everything I'm happy with. But again, I would think that it's for us to say more. If we are not happy, we can uh, put an up and out there, uh, put other things. And up to this point, I still see that those wheels are being at least Knowledge, whether they will assimilate and make into policy, I think that is a process that uh, I, I've been in the US and uh, in Hong Kong, and I, I see that the civic society component is actually quite active in Hong Kong. Although uh, there may be people saying that, okay, I want more or faster, but uh, actually, I, I myself is uh, thinking that. We need to strengthen, uh, not necessarily just one way, just by consultation. Consultation, I, I just from the format of consultation, a few questions, and sometimes the question is too limited, uh, may not necessarily be the best way. But as professionals, I actually think that it's also our responsibility to give views from time to time. Can I give an extra example? Extra example now. Uh, the, uh, the government engaged in <coughs> public consultation the last year on land supply. You heard about the big debate. Okay? But before the consultation results are over, which is in December, the government announced last week a momentous decision before the result is known. And furthermore, the government proposed a choice that wasn't even in the consultation. So, I mean, this is a real in-your-face example now as we speak. Okay, so that you can very hardly convince the civil society consultation consequential. I mean, now we all know Carrie Lam just kind of lie in our face that she interrupt, preempt this consultation to make the decision that's supposed for public debate. So I'm just giving you a real-life example right now that make all the consultation have no credibility in the future Hong Kong people say, wait a minute, why should I waste my time? I mean, this is a real life example now to people overseas. I mean, it's supposed to have a nine month consultation with the result in December, but two weeks ago, the chief executive announced a decision, furthermore, a decision that was not part of the elective, the whole nine months to consult the public on. So, how, how can we trust the government in terms of having consequential consultation, right? I'm from a different background from everyone here. I'm a marine biologist. Um, I've been hearing a lot of problems or issues, but haven't hearing in that can solve it. And I mean, I've heard drainage and everything, but um, are there any more green solutions that might work in Hong Kong? I'm, I'm working with, uh, I'm working in Nanbo, so um, I have got some projects about Spong City. So um, I think uh, I also talk with Journey Service Department nowadays, and then they really try hard um, on implement the green uh, sustainable journey system and also work closely with Sunjun uh, government um, on these kind of issues. So I think, um, um, although um, you may not see uh, lot of big projects, but actually uh, for um, you can go to some estate or new town, they have actually installed some green roofs or uh, use some of, such of the green in infrastructure design to address climate issue. So I think uh, the, the, um, the challenge is still there, but I think uh, the direction is positive. Yeah. And um, I think Hong Kong, as I said, I just want to um, response answers and Professor, I forget, uh, Gun, yeah, yeah. Professor Gan, I, I, I really think uh, uh, our way forward, other than public precipitation, is actually very important. I agree with you too. It's working very close with the uh, government 
uh, because I think Hong Kong uh, has done lots of good science, has a uh, lot of talent, and also government officials very effective and got a very, very good uh, scientific database and things like that. And Hong Kong certainly is uh, leading one as well. I think, I think um, nowadays, I think, uh, can actually, because as as far as I I I, I realize or I observe, uh, for example, typhoon comes to our region, not just impact to Hong Kong, but actually impact maybe three or four cities together. So I think uh, we should work closer to build up the warning system, not just focus on Hong Kong, but maybe a warning system is applied to the whole region, and that is benefit not just to 8 million people, but actually 50 to 70 million people. I think it's a very good perspective because we're, we're outside, we're talking about many issues we're facing in terms of challenge for the next century or so. Um, that's why we, we have to face it and we'll be prepared and have to, to, to the research uh, and also the, the the actual implementation both in terms of the infrastructure and the community. Um, that's all about sustainability and I think the, there's still hope because uh, if you look at the SDG uh, uh, 14 for ocean, for example, I'm the, from the ocean side, and also if you look at the road economy concept, it's essentially adopted from groom green uh, development, and that's the concepts that try to decouple the development and the environmental damage of ecosystem conservation. We can do both, actually. And one of the hope is the technology. New technology, we have, we're, we're leading to the fourth uh, industrial revolution, and uh, many things we are seeing now, actually you couldn't have imagined 20, back 20 years ago. So carbon neutralization is not impossible. It's actually doable, just the amount of the action we have to take and also the, 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 the coordination communication between different sectors of the, the society has to be working together. That's the final uh, key hope to the future, I think. Uh, actually, I, I see it because the discussion seemed to go on a little bit uh, quite lengthy. I actually take a more positive, uh, I see a lot of this as opportunities. Uh, I, when the IPCC AL4 uh, report first come out, uh, we start talking, having a general education course in the university about climate change. And uh, we, kind of tell the student, okay, all this problem, how big the problem is, and then how much you need global collaboration to solve this problem. And uh, any student with any good sense will say, well, wow, this is too bad. For them, it is kind of impossible. They don't see a solution. And some of, particularly the motivated, uh, serious students, uh, a lot of them get this solution. And I learned from that experience that actually uh, talking negative is not helping, particularly for our younger generation. And actually, I see this is a, a chance for our younger generation. It's a challenge, definitely, it's not easy. It's a challenge for them to think about new ways of dealing with it. It may be for people who are engineers, they have to think about engineering solutions. For people who are in social science or in other, they have to think about uh, policy or uh, community solution. But if you think about the challenge, the way I look at it is uh, really I follow the, the famous saying, uh, every generation has their own challenge. Really, it's the, this is the challenge for us now, and I think we should step up and face it. And we should turn it as a challenge and opportunity for the new generation to uh, Growth. And a lot of time when, because big data is that always a topic when, okay, AI is going to take away a job and, and all this. I see environmental job, environmental issues. It's is not something AI can easily handle. I always tell my students that uh, if you are 
looking into environmental issues, you need to look at the whole system. And this is some, if you develop this type of skill set, uh, you don't have to worry about AI taking the job. So I actually think sometimes we have to take a more positive note to tell the next generation, well, uh, although there's a lot of problem, but these are the challenges. If you can do it well, then uh, there's a lot of uh, hope. Of, I would say there's a lot of opportunity there for you to grow. Okay. If, if I may, I also, uh, if I may share with you one insight about the 1.5 degree and the 2 degree uh, issue uh, to translate some of the science into that as well. I was told. challenge and the opportunity because I learned that uh, quite a number of European countries or scientists they were so happy that uh, you know that they say feed into some of the thinking that internal combustion engine should not be there for a number of years I think some some comics already made the decoration Volvo is one of the uh, the internal combustion engine. So I think to a lot of uh, young people um, that uh, or people interested in this subject area, the the challenge and opportunity is there because um, I think as, as we speak, uh, the one point five degrees. Uh, some people say it's still not good enough. Let's be realistic. If you cut uh, um, 80 percent um, of the emissions, what does it mean? I'll give you one more example. In IMO, International Mar uh, Maritime Organization, declared that uh, in 2050 they want to cut CO2 by 50 percent, 50. But the reality is this: globally, our goods transported all over the world account for the shipping industry account for 80% of, of the activity. So can they, you know, offload all these costs to the customer? That's another thing. So so what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the problem is with solution at this moment is elusive because you I want to share with you some of the so-called solution right now. By cutting 50%, cutting 80%, some of the solution being advocated by the Europeans or, or the, some of the experts in this field, they are um, hydrogen fuel cell, wind, solar. So nuclear, some, a lot of people object to it, but it's part of it. But nowhere near the 50 and the 80 percent reduction targets. So we have a big gap. But what I'm trying to say here is this: Is the solution unique to Hong Kong? Certainly not. This is a global issue. But are we are we working together to address that the common problem? No. <laughs> I heard a lot of the interesting discussion on that. Is that those people holding the information or the potential
digital solution cannot share it uh, for commercial reason, for, for whatever reason. So, so I think uh, um, the this is a very really interesting uh, uh, mind-boggling problem uh, that we are we are facing right now. That, uh, but of course, with the uh, uh, severe typhoons uh, that. Uh, Saying that it won't be there because uh, I think uh, you know in your, the problem is so severe that <laughs> the challenge is certainly there. But of course, with existing technology, I don't think we, anyone can promise the reduction of uh, uh, eighty percent. But that was the target set, the one point five degree that we, we want to hold it. Is we need a solution. But I. I I think the gap is just too wide right now from, from my perspective. So uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, oh. OK, you have uh, another burning question. All right. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, just a comment um, related to the solution as well. Um, OK. And it's really exciting to hear about all the uh, knowledge from um, your experts. Um, also, not really to give you some background about this uh, sea level research and uh, try to bring in some positive side into this progress. You know, and, uh, you know, like many speaker already mentioned, there are difficulty. But uh, if you put it into the context of uh, what the community has achieved, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous like, achievement. Because uh, as I said you know, in my talk, you know, because we have a new observation, so now we, uh, we have a little bit of better understanding and now we can do a little bit of, you know, more like a theoretical and numerical simulation of our system. But imagine 20 years ago, we even don't know how the global sea level, you know, it's, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the right is accelerating or not, whether there's uh, like any kind of variability associated with the aluminium. So we don't know because we have no global you know, measurement until we have the satellite altimetry. 
starting from uh, 93. So then, you know, we have the global coverage, and then we try to get this budget closure problem. So basically, we try, because you have the total sea level, and then you have the co contribution, like uh, some expansion, the melting of, uh, you know, the land ice, like a glacier, you know, Greenland, you know, ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet. So basically, you try to sum up those contributions and to see whether it's equal to the total sea level. In fact, you know, the community had a, had a big trouble to close the budget. So that's uh, like uh, talking about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But until we have this increased supply, you know, starting from 2003, so now we can close the you know, global mean sea level budget pretty well. So thinking about what we have uh, you know, been you know, like achieving in the past two or three decades, it's, uh, it's huge. And also, the deterrent is regional. Uh, it's it is, yeah. So at, uh, yeah, maybe back to the this sea level thing, it's, uh, you can think about uh, three spatial scale. So one is global. The other is, uh, you know, if you move further, it's a region like a basin uh, type, and uh, talking about at least a few hundred kilometer. But then the local phenomena, like uh, say the Hong Kong area. So basically, for the IPCC, you know, in the past, like a few like assessment, right? So basically, it's concentrated on the global and the regional. But now it's time to move to the like really coastal and the localized like, kind of phenomena. So that's uh, I think the one part is. Uh, and again, I want to express me like this is observational. It's so important because, uh, like uh, Professor Gannon mentioned about this local kind of change of the, the kind of land reclamation. So we got this change of your tidal gate measurement. So to be honest, without the tidal gate, even though no, you wouldn't detect any change either. But if even there, the, you, know, you know, like the observation, you still need to be very cautious to interpret your results. So in some sense, we need a high quality, you know, where, you know, Calibrated the you know, observation record, and uh, as long as uh, you know, as long as possible, then we can you know identify and detect any long-term climate change. So that's about the local. But uh, globally, thinking about uh, you know how the Hong Kong can contribute, it's uh, maybe Hong Kong you know has the financial like uh, you know situation. Maybe it can help with the international observing like uh, you know effort. For example, in the tropical uh, Pacific, we have the Tau Hui. So it has been there for like uh, 30 years. Uh, but uh, now they are kind of uh, in the need of like uh, financial support. You know, because the US is uh, withdrawing, you know, like uh, don't want to uh, invest a lot, even don't want to like uh, keep the same level of uh, support. But uh, if uh, any people are working in the climate, you know the tall we is uh, how important it is. Because, uh, because of that, uh, we can understand that you are an email better, we can do the better, much better season prediction. And the those things, you know, if you uh, you know, maintain for a long time, it will help you to understand that it's a long-term climate change issue. Similar thing like a deep ocean. So I, as I mentioned today, we have this uh, Argo flow we can measure upper 2,000 meter. But uh, how about the, you know, the, the sea ocean like uh, below 2,000 meter? We don't have a very good measurement. But uh, for the climate change, the sun signal will you know, penetrate the deep ocean very quickly due to the sun mechanism. But for that part, we don't have very good observation at all. You know, all the kind of development in any field, it's a starting with the observation, and then try to, people can try to understand it, and try to explain it, come with some like a theoretical idea, and then try to use models to simulate. So everything happened like this. But here, there are lots of things, you know, still like a, maybe um, we, we don't know anywhere. But uh, as long as we are willing to invest more in the observation and uh, you know, do a like, kind of step-by-step -step measure, so think about 20 years from now, I think we are we are in a very good position again. I agree with you again, but then the one advertisement is that uh, yeah. um, tomorrow. Tomorrow, <laughs> but then also um, the uh, the opportunity for the Greater Bay Area and research funding. I was told, um, you know, there are lots of opportunities. Looking at the uh, time management issue as well, that, that we have a few more minutes left. Uh, may I invite uh, Professor Jimmy Bong to close this session for us? Because uh, we we heard a lot, but then the, you know if you may have give us a concluding remark. That would be I don't think. Yeah, don't before think the Professor uh, found the conclusion, can I make an announcement tomorrow? You want to see the, what is happening in Hong Kong, the eutrophication, hypoxia, please come.
join us. Is it the same room? Same room. Same room, room. same coffee, same, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 well, it is, uh, it is good this afternoon, it is uh, only this art, and uh, we see so many uh, uh, different stakeholders come into this room, uh, scientists, academics, government department, and general public, and financial sectors, and, and it is a very good start to, this is a really big problem, and it is good to start this discussion, certainly we will not be the end, and, uh, and uh, we have a note taker here, be summarizing a lot more, and uh, hopefully they will they will summarize it correctly and uh, report on Monday. But uh, certainly, uh, more work needs to be done in the academic community to identify uh, uh, the, the real issue, so that the policymaker uh, can make the correct decision. But at the community level, we certainly hear, heard a lot of uh, people raising their concerns about uh, whether their local area or a bigger problem in, you know, where the, these one million people going to live. And uh, all these decisions need to be made and uh, with the scientific community and hopefully we will help the government uh, together to make the correct decision for all of us. Okay. With that, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow, uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, is it 9 o'clock or 9.30? 9. 9? Okay, 9 o'clock. So, Sunday morning, the traffic is quieter. So, to come to the chair, <laughs> it's, it's not that far. Okay? And uh, before the end, and uh, we will have a dinner uh, later. But, uh, yeah. I'm one of the guys who's got the job of nail taking. I'm not very good at it. If you've got something you want me to include, I've written my email address there. <laughs> Could you email it to me by lunchtime tomorrow, say? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that, so uh, if you're interested to join the dinner tonight, so outside we have a uh, super helper to, uh, to lead you to the coach and take you to, uh, to a Crown Plaza hotel, Crown Plaza hotel in, uh, in uh, Chiang Kai-Gong. Okay, it's just uh, about four and an hour drive from here. <laughs>